This week I was reminded of um, kind of my errors in judgment sometimes. If, if you're like me and you've read through the Bible, and, and I won't ask you to put up your hand, but if you've read through something like the book of Numbers, and then you compare that with maybe John's Gospel, um, you would think, well, if I'm going to have to listen to a sermon, I probably could listen to a few verses in John, much more than I don't even know how the pastor would deal with a chapter in Numbers or Leviticus. And so as you know, um, we have been kind of taking a week in Romans, but we've discovered Romans can be very heavy with some deep, awkward theology that we might not want to hear. And we've been looking at the Gospel of Luke. Now, I was thinking, well, this will be easier. It's not as convicting. Um, and yet, from last week, we, we heard some very important truth. Jesus is real. We're not talking about a philosophy. We're not talking about a school of thought. We're not talking about a, a perspective in the world or just you know a school of success or whatever. We're talking about a real person who really existed and Luke begins his gospel by giving us precise historical markers as if to say, look, here it is. It's history. This actually happened. And we heard the message. Now, we might have expected a different message. Good news, everybody. I've, I bring salvation for everyone. Or, or maybe if we were to listen to some of the phony teachers, uh, Joel Osteen or whoever, we would think Jesus would come on the scene saying, hey, everybody, I just want you to be more successful. I just want you to enjoy life more. You just got to have more faith. But that wasn't the message. The confronting message that John preached wasn't about, hey, you, you need to get in now and get on the ground floor to this really great idea. John's message was, um, you need to be aware of your spiritual condition and it's judgment from God and you need to repent. You need to repent. There is no salvation apart from repentance. You need to repent and be baptized. You need to declare in front of everyone, um, I need to make a big change in my life. And then we saw those words that are used in sometimes Christmas or Easter, um, the cantatas, how every crooked road has been made straight and the valleys have been lifted up and the mountains have been leveled down. We don't have to go to great ex as lengths or wander around trying to find the truth anymore. We, we don't have to try to figure out, well, how do I get to the person who is really telling me the truth? The truth is apparent now. It's this real person who is God incarnate, who came, lived among us so that we might know exactly what is the truth. It's very plain now. That also means there's no excuse. Now, I found it interesting that um, a couple of my students in my chemistry class didn't get the score in the latest test that they wanted, and they were asking for extra credit. And so I said, well, I'll tell you what, you can listen to one of my sermons. <laughs> so they did. And they came back and um, they showed me their notes. They had to do outlines and notes. And the one girl said, it was like sitting in a class. It's nothing like the church I go to. <laughs> you were talking about repentance. We never hear that at our church. I will say, I don't want to hear any more about your church. Thank you very much. <laughs> but I'm glad you heard the truth. And I don't know what they do at other churches. I don't know how they avoid the idea that our spiritual condition is rather bleak. It's not that we just need a little bit of help. It's not that we're looking for sort of the latest self-improvement. You're almost there. It's not that we're looking for the self-awareness. Hey, you could be doing a lot better if you would just let Jesus help you. And the idea you get from some of these odd teachers. No, the idea is Romans chapter 1, verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed against everyone because we rebel against his revelation. 
because we do things that we know are wrong, because we deny him his glory and honor. And here we started out with Luke. Yes, that's your position, and therefore you need to be making a public declaration of repentance and be baptized. You know you need to be saved from this, this spiritual condition. And so we come to this very same topic today in Romans chapter 2. We'll be finishing with chapter 2 today. External signs and eternal judgment. External signs and eternal judgment. Romans chapter 2, we'll be going from verses 25 through 29. Now, Paul has been making the argument. He's been presenting the case. Well, who needs Jesus as a Messiah? Is it just the Jewish people? And in chapter 1, he made the very clear case. Well, of course, it's the immoral people who need to be cleansed from their sins. And we would all say, well, yeah. These people who commit crimes and they live a life of just complete immorality. Well, of course, they need Jesus. And then in an uncomfortable turn of events, chapter 2 begins with, well, but when you use that idea of a moral standard, you have to admit that moral standard now applies to you. And you don't measure up. You're just maybe a little bit higher up on the scale. And then we took a look, as Paul says, not only that, but what about really religious people? good people. They really are trying. And we saw the uncomfortable development. Even if you're really trying to do your best and be a good person, you'll never be good enough. Well, now Paul is going to really make a problem for himself. And if you're like perhaps many people, you're going to read these verses going, what in the world is this about? Um, but we're going to find out. This it looks like it's very complex and difficult and maybe doesn't apply to us at all. Romans chapter 2, verse 25 and following. There are people who are saying, well, wait a minute, I'm very religious. Doesn't that count for something? Well, Paul says, now, circumcision has its value if you practice the law. But if you break the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcised man obeys the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised man who keeps the law judge you who despise the written code and circumcision and transgress the law? For a person who is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision something that is outward in the flesh. But someone is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is of the heart by the spirit, and not by the written code. This person's praise is not from people, but from God. Well, now we're dealing with people that have obvious signs of commitment. Now, as I said, you might be looking at this going, this is about Jewish people. I'll, uh, I'll kind of wait for you to get to those verses that deal with us Gentiles. <laughs> but we're going to see, oh no, this is unfortunately applicable to us also. We're dealing with external signs. And Paul makes the beginning statement, yes, an outward sign is very good if it matches what's in your heart. An outward sign is very good. It does have value if you do practice what that sign represents. Now, yes, if you are uh, circumcised and you do practice the whole law, that's a great thing. Paul would say, no, that's not possible. Okay, then what happens? Well, if you do break the law, now you've got a problem. Now, Paul has been at this for a while. Th this isn't something that Paul is just kind of coming up with as he's dictating this letter. Paul has undoubtedly had many dialogues with people in the synagogues or in the marketplaces, and we could almost hear some, someone say, Paul, wait a minute. I understand how the immoral people would need Messiah and be cleansed from their sins. I, I understand how someone who is not Jewish 
would need that. But you're forgetting, Paul, we've been given the law. We're the chosen people. And in fact, we have circumcision to prove that. That's a sign that, well, we're part of the chosen people. So are you really sure this applies to us? Now, did they really believe that? Well, if you want to go look, and I would be surprised if anyone did, um, I found it interesting that many of the commentators didn't even go this way. But because I have a lot of Hebrew studies in my background, I did. And this is what the rabbis would say. In the Genesis Rabbah, which was kind of the teaching of the rabbis after uh, the temple was destroyed, they decided to try to get most of their oral teachings in written form. Rabbi Levi in the Genesis Rabbah says, the circumcised will not enter Gehenna. Father Abraham will be at the entrance to Gehenna and he will prevent the circumcised from entering. In fact, this is wild. Father Abraham will take the innocent Gentiles and circumcise them and take those things and put them on the truly wicked Jewish people so that they become again uncircumcised. So the Lord will be vindicated. There will be no uncircumcised people in paradise, but there will be uncircumcised people in Gehenna. Now, if you heard that as a good Jew, you would say, Paul, you're forgetting this. All I have to do is be circumcised and I don't go to Gehenna. Father Abraham is going to prevent me from going in there. Now, some of you are thinking, well, okay, but what's that got to do with us? I remembered this week when we had our first child, uh, some of my wife's parent, uh, grandparents were really upset. They were Episcopalian, and we didn't have our baby christened. Well, how do you know your baby would go to heaven if something happens? Now, I'm not a, an expert on Catholicism, but I understand part of that faith is you go and you have your baby blessed by the priest, and, well, that means you go to heaven, I guess, unless you commit one of those seven really bad sins. And, you know, the more we think about this, there are many ways that we trust in external signs. Well, I've been baptized. We were talking with a particular visitor, and uh, they had come to our church a few weeks ago and had asked them, do you... Do you normally go to a Southern Baptist church? Are you looking for a... Oh, yes, I've been baptized. Okay, you've been baptized. I've heard people say, well, I'm a member of such and such a church. I've heard responses of, um, well, I regularly attend, you know. I'm on this committee. Um, I've, I've been doing this activity in the church for years, whatever that may be. We put a lot of stock. We're very impressed by outward signs. And I know I've told you before, at uh, the church I grew up in, Melrose Baptist in Oakland, when there was any kind of new committee, when there was a changing of the trustees and the deacons, they just kind of switched places on those two teams. Um, we always knew who was going to be on either one of them because it was the people who owned businesses. It was the people who contributed a lot. It was the people whose family kind of started the church or had been involved in the church for decades. They never introduced him to the congregation by saying, let's hear a word of testimony from Brother Skippy. And yet that's what Paul is bringing us to see. It's not these outward signs that we, we want to accept. It's not whether you are the member of a church. It's not whether you go to church on a consistent basis. It's not whether you regularly contribute, impressively contribute. This is rather shocking. Paul said, you know, you can be whatever type of external sign you want to put in here. You could be circumcised. You could be the member of the church. You could be baptized. You could be a Sunday school teacher. But if that doesn't match what's in your heart, that has no validity at all. You are deceived. 
and you will not enter into his presence. You're still on the outside. We have to wonder how many people are not certain about that. How many people would think, but I've been going to church for as long as I can remember. I can show you my tax statements. I have been putting money and been getting tax deductions for decades, as soon as I was an adult. I've been on committees at the church. I've taught Sunday school. What would we do if the Apostle Paul was right here this morning and say, yeah, but none of that counts. Tell me about your relationship with Jesus. That might cause a hesitation. Gentiles will take the place of the circumcised. This, this was unthinkable. Now, not only did the Jews believe that Father Abraham will keep us from entering Gehenna, but there was part of the, the teaching, and, and we can read it in the prophets, that when Messiah returns, there will be judgment. There will be judgment. And of course, the Jewish people said, well, those of us who are righteous get to judge the Gentiles. They're the ones that have been treating us badly for, well, forever. And as Paul was preaching this message, there must have been some Jewish people who said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me my circumcision makes no difference? And Paul said, no, it doesn't. And not only this, but these people that you're counting on being able to put in their place and giving them the payback, they're going to be judging you. How shocking that must have been to hear. Wait a minute. You think these Gentiles are going to judge me? Paul said, yes. Because if they do what the law requires and they're following Jesus, and you don't do what the law requires, and you're not following Jesus because you're trusting in external signs, you are guilty. You don't have a declaration of innocent awaiting you. You have a declaration of guilty before your, his throne. Your outward sign is not authentic. Your outward sign makes no difference. And in fact, those who don't have the outward signs are the ones that are authentic. Those who are not able to say, yeah, I've been going to synagogue since, well, before I can remember. And You mean we're going to be the ones that are judged? This must have gotten their attention. And Paul says, now, not only is your circumcision not really of any importance, not only is your law only there because it really brings you condemnation, you're not a Jew necessarily just because you come from Father Abraham. You're not a Jew necessarily just because you've been circumcised. You're not a Jew necessarily because you can say, see, I've got my copy of the law. It's not anything external at all. Paul would give us the same clear question if you're putting your hope in an external sign, but I come to church, but I've been baptized, but I regularly contribute, but I'm on committees, Paul would say, be careful. None of that matters. None of that matters. What does matter, Paul? Verse 29. Well, then who... Who is going to be the chosen ones before God's throne? Who will be the ones that hear the declaration not guilty? Who are going to be the ones that enter into his presence? Paul says, now someone is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is on the heart. By the spirit and not written by some code, not performed by some person. This person's praise is not from people, but from God. 
Now, we need to say real quick, this is not replacement theory. It's not that the church is necessarily replacing Israel. Who really is Jewish? Paul is saying, be very careful. You're not necessarily God's chosen because you're kind of come up with external signs. But here's my membership card. I'm a member of this church. I've been baptized. I've got this really nice frame certificate. Paul is saying, your testimony is not external. Your evidence wouldn't be that people in the church would say, I see him here whenever the doors are open. Your testimony is on the heart by the Spirit. Now, that makes it hard for us to see. It's easy for us to see external signs. It's easy for us to be judgmental on external signs. As good Baptists, sometimes we find that easy to do. <laughs> it's a whole lot harder to be able to look in someone's heart and say, they have freedom in the spirit. They have a lifestyle that they're working on, but their heart has been changed. That's a whole different ability. We don't have that. Outward signs do not bring in innocence. Nor does real faith have an outward sign. We, we want to think that. We want to think that if I really have faith, there should be an outward sign. I should have a better car. I should have a better house. I should have health. Isn't that what they teach? Isn't that the nonsense they come up with? You should have better health. You should have a fatter wallet. You should be more successful. Those would be the outward signs. Except Paul is saying there are no outward signs to salvation necessarily. It's in your heart. The true sign is in your heart. Now, you might be thinking, Paul, that's a total departure from what the law teaches. That's totally different from what our teacher Moses gave us when he came down from the mountain. I would call your attention. There are many places where we could show this. I would call your attention to Deuteronomy. Moses comes down from the mountain. He's had a meeting with the Almighty. Deuteronomy 10, 16. The people have been delivered from Egypt. No sooner do they get the Lord's rules and laws than they break them. No sooner does the Lord say, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. They begin to look for somebody else, it would seem. So verse 16 However, only to your ancestors did he show this loving favor, and he chose you, their descendants, from all people. It's apparent today. Therefore, cleanse your heart. That really is circumcise your heart and stop being so stubborn. All the way back in Deuteronomy. Circumcise your heart. In Jeremiah 31, 33. Jeremiah is ministering to people who have seen the devastation of Babylonian captivity. They're wondering, does it pay to serve the Lord? And they know that they have been taken captive because of their sin, their rebellion. Of all things, Jeremiah says, this is the word of the Lord. Jeremiah 31, 33. Some of you might have memorized this. The day is coming, says the Lord. The day is coming when I'm going to give you a new hope and a new covenant. Indeed, the time is coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and Judah. It will not be like the old covenant that I made with their ancestors when I delivered them from Egypt. For they violated that covenant almost from the day they got it, even though I was like a faithful husband to them. But I will make a new covenant with the whole nation Israel and I plant them back in the land, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and write it on their hearts and minds. And I will be their God and they will be my people. This was not a new idea. From the law and from the prophets and there are many other places we could go to this morning. Uh, the expectation if you really are committed to the Almighty, if he really is your savior, it's in your heart. It's not on an outward sign. Now, as we conclude this morning, there are some very important ideas. 
we need to recognize our estimation, our idea of our spiritual condition is often very faulty. We may think that we just need a little bit of help. We may think that we just need to try a little bit harder, be more involved in church. Read my Bible perhaps more regularly. The fundamental truth of our spiritual condition is Romans chapter 1, verse 18. We are under the wrath of God because we cannot measure up to his standards on our own. Because we constantly rebel against what we know is true. We need to have a new law, one that's written in our hearts. Involvement, church membership, baptism, how much we give to the church, how many books we read, what kind of classes we take, how often we go to women's Bible study or men's Bible study, how hard it is for us to say in and of themselves, those don't make any difference. Yes, we want people to be involved. We need certain people to really use their talents and skills for all kinds of things here. But in and of itself, those skills, those talents, those involvements in the church don't bring you salvation. The real question, the real question is your heart circumcised? Is your heart circumcised? Not the outward sign. If asked to give a testimony, would you talk about what you do in the church? Would you talk about how many Bibles you have? Would you talk about how much money you put in the plate? Or would you talk about Jesus? I would call your attention to Matthew chapter 7. Very chilling words. Jesus had been teaching the disciples what it means to be a true follower and how you might think the Pharisees, the religious leaders were examples for everyone. Jesus is pointing out that's not necessarily true. There's a narrow gate that very few will enter. You can know a tree by its fruit. If you really are planted in the Lord, you are expected to bring forth fruit. Verse 21 of chapter 7 of Matthew. Um, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who knows who Jesus is, has gone to church for many years, maybe all of their life, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Not everyone who has all of these impressive outward signs but only the one who does the will of my Father. Only the one who does the will of my Father. Verse 22. On that day, many will come to me. Many will come to me. The marriage feast of the Lamb. They're on the outside, and they will say, Lord, Lord, let us in. Did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name cast out demons and do many powerful deeds. Lord, let us in. You know who we are. We have done these external signs. Very impressive external signs. I haven't done many powerful deeds. I've heard about casting out demons. I've never done it. Are these people somehow further along the road than me? Why aren't they in? Then Jesus says, I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. That's in the aorist tense. It's a statement of fact. I haven't known you in the past. I don't know who you are now, and I won't know you in the future. I don't know who you are. In fact, you have been practicing these things for your own recognition. Therefore, you are lawbreakers. Depart from me. I never knew you. There will be people standing before the judgment throne who will say, wait a minute, you're making a mistake. You know who I am. I've been in church. I've done these many important deeds. I've been on these important committees. I've made things happen. You have to know who I am. And Jesus will say, oh, I know who you are. You're a lawbreaker. 
You did this for your own recognition. You did this for the tax write-offs. I don't know who you are. You're not one of mine. There's a very chilling message this morning. Depending upon outward signs is deception. Depending upon our own efforts, deception. There is but one sure sign that I will be accepted by the Father if I have Jesus as my Messiah. Father Abraham is not going to protect me from the fires of Gehenna. The blood of Jesus will. And so our closing question this morning, external outward signs. There are many of them. How often do you go to church? How much money do you put in the plate? Do you go to Sunday school? Are you on various committees? We're impressed with those things. All of those things potentially bring eternal judgment. Because the real question is, well, what happened on your heart? What happened between you and Jesus? Is it in your heart or are you depending upon outward signs? You might be one of those people who come before his throne and say, wait a minute. I was really involved in my church. I gave a lot of money. I made that place happening. You have to know who I am. Isn't it interesting? The Lord doesn't know who we are. The Father in heaven knows who Jesus is. Now that's the big question. Have you made a relationship with Jesus? All these other outward signs are of no value for you. The last thing we should want to hear is those very chilling words. I don't know who you are. Depart from me. That's what happens when you depend upon outward signs. That's what happens when you think you're successful enough. We can avoid hearing those eternally depressing, painful words if we follow Jesus. Not an outward sign, but an inward circumcision of our heart made by Jesus and the Spirit. Now that is the difference. Is your heart changed this morning? If you are depending upon outward signs, please don't leave before you talk to me. If you want to know how you can have absolute certainty with Jesus, please talk to me. And if you have, let this be a time with great joy and certainty. You don't have to have outward signs. I don't necessarily live like a reprobate, but I know that all my own efforts aren't going to be the deciding factor because I'll never be enough. I can depend upon Jesus. That brings freedom. That brings certainty. Let us pray. Our Father, it's easy for us to look at other people and even ourselves and think that we are good enough, we've done enough, we are impressive enough, and we are impressed with outward signs. People who do a lot, people who have... Um, unusual skills and talents. Help us to be as discerning that we want to be uh, impressed with those who have a testimony of you. We want to be impressed with those who can talk about how they have had a heart change because of you. Let that be our goal. Let that be the characteristic of this church. We are people who have come together because our hearts have been changed and we want them to be even more changed by Messiah Jesus. For your honor and glory, we pray these things. Amen.